Um, and welcome visitors. If you're here today, we're glad to have you with us, those online. We're thankful for the opportunity, to, opportunity with you as well. We are in Revelation, the seventh chapter this morning. Take your Bibles and turn there, if you will, Revelation 7, verses 9 through 17. I want to read those, then we'll <clears throat> begin to talk about those verses. Revelation 7, 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Those who are clothed in white robes, who are they and where have they come from? I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and will guide them to springs of water of life, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Heavenly Father, we are thankful to have this opportunity today. We are grateful to gather together to worship you and to worship our Savior. Thank you for those who have come into this sanctuary today. Those who are online, I pray you would meet them in a special way. Speak your word to them through your spirit. Give them understanding. I pray, Father, that as we look at these words, you will help us in our walk with you. Father, we recognize that we are in a fallen world and death comes and we grieve with those who grieve today. Father, we also realize that life is short. and We are so grateful to know that there's a way to be right with you where death no, no longer can have its dominion over us and we can be set free and know that we, when we breathe our last here is to step into heaven and have eternal life and enjoy you forever. Thank you for that. Thank you for Jesus, our sin bearer, who came, who died, who rose again in triumph, and through faith in him, we can live, we can know, we can understand. Father, we struggle to walk, as you know, as we should. I pray that you would grant repentance in our hearts and speak to us in those areas where we need to make an adjustment for your glory. Help me as I proclaim. Father, I pray for the listener and myself as we respond to your word, that it would be according to what you would have. In Jesus' name, amen. As I stand before you, um, I'm aware of this, that I'm fairly tired, and many of you <laughs> are fairly tired, and I'm asking that God would, in this moment, meet us as he would please. Um, I love the Wild Game Dinner. Uh, we had, we believe, uh, around 10 individuals that responded to the gospel, and that's what it's all about, you know, to see people come to a saving faith in Christ. All right. Seventh chapter, the last part of this, let's get to it. Uh, one of the truths that come up time and again in Scripture, and one that I think we need to keep our minds on, is that believers are, tri are triumphant. We are victorious in Christ. Of course, this is the last thing that the devil would want you to remember and live out in your daily life. As believers, we realize we, are, we live in a broken world, and it impacts us at every corner. This sin-cursed world, it touches every relationship we have, from spouses to families to our friends. They, they all feel the effects of it, and they see it played out day after day. In the middle of this mess, God takes our failures and circumstances, and at times brings us to the end of ourselves in order that we might grow and become more useful as his servants. What I'm saying 
is that life on this side of heaven contains joy, tremendous joy, and heartache, peace, and grief. But when all is said and done, what I really want you to understand today is God always causes his people to triumph. Don't forget that. We see that in this chapter. We begin in verse 9. There's the multitude there. And I want to catch you up to speed just for a moment to where we're at, okay? It's quite a book, this book of Revelation. We began in chapter 1. We saw the outline to the book, the things which were, that was chapter 1. The things which are, that was chapters 2 and 3 with the seven churches. We are in the futuristic aspect of this book, the things which are yet to come. And that's where we're at this morning. We walk through that fourth and fifth chapter, amazing chapters. We see there the triumph of believers. We're there in glory, worshiping around the throne. There was an event in that fifth chapter where, where the call out was, is, is there anyone worthy to take the scroll? That scroll had seven seals that began to unfold what we've been observing in chapters 6, 7, and right through the end of, of, of the book of Revelation where God's wrath is poured out. Now we understand that the church is taking out before that an event called the rapture where, where Christ come and get, comes and gets his bride. So we've entered into the aspect of, of the book of Revelation where it's pretty heavy stuff. I say it'll set your hair on fire. Some of you don't have much hair to set on fire, but, and I'm gaining on you there. But it, that's what it does. You know, you kind of sit back and you're wondering, what's this all about? And then we see that here, and we see God and his holiness and justice. But we're continuing on here, and, and chapter 7 is sort of this pause, this pause in, in, in the wrath of God and the wrath of the Lamb. This is a futuristic event. There's, we are in this tribulation period. I believe in, in chapter 9 and 10, we're around the midpoint of it. But we've taken a pause here. And God's just given us some information. So in, in verse 9, we pick it up there. After these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude. After what things? Well, uh, those 144,000 that we saw there. And there are seven features here in the multitude uh, in verses 9 through 12 that I, I just want to speak to for a minute. First of all, they are vast. Those gathered around the throne, they, they are vast. It, we've been given a number in, in verses uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 there, of the 144,000, we saw them. But here John looks and he sees, and there's this, this vast number, a, a number that no one could count. It's incalculable before the throne. And uh, it, we, we see previously those 144,000 male Jewish evangelists, but here this group far exceeds them. If you remember chapter 5, verse 11, John had the glimpse into, into the heavenly throne where the church was there, had been raptured and described in heaven in this way. There were myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands. I believe who he's referencing here, and we'll get to it in a bit, are these, these uh, uh, um, tribulation saints. But they are vast. No one could count them. It's a great multitude. And notice as well, they're worldwide. He says, after these things I looked, behold, a great multitude, which no one can count, could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. They were worldwide from every tribe. This previous section, the focal point was on those those select 144,000 Jewish male bond servants, but here the mass before the throne is mixed, and it, it, it contains those that are non-Jewish or, or Gentile. When it says, from every tribe, tongue, and nation, he's saying this is a mixed group. And they are saved during this tribulation period. Verse 14, I saw him, I said to him, my Lord, you know, he's speaking of the, these, these are the ones, he says, who've come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white. They have come to faith in Christ. That's what's happened here. Now, I don't know if it's because of the 144,000, what they've been proclaiming, but someone has given them a witness, and we were reminded last week that there's always a remnant. God has a witness to the people that are in the, that are in the world, and he desires for men and women, boys and girls, to be saved and to come to faith in Christ. And I, I want to make one more point here. These have come out of the tribulation. They are the ones that stepped into the tribulation unsaved. 
So these are new believers. The tribulation period is seven years long. The rapture occurs before the tribulation period. Everyone that steps into that, they do not, they do not know Christ. And yet there's this great movement of, of individuals coming to him. They're, they're worldwide. And they're saved. The gospel has set them free. And they're standing. They're standing. Notice that again in verse 9. They are standing before the throne. Standing before the throne. Uh, they're victors. It, it, can, it, it denotes life. Their bodies had yielded to death. And the power of gravity had taken them to the grave. And I'm reminded today that the grave bids all to come. All to come who breathe their last. But now in heaven... Now in heaven, they are standing more alive than they have ever been. Death has lost its grip. What a scene is set before us. Amen? Amen. Amen. And they, are under the, they were under, think about this, they were under the wrath of God. They came to faith in Christ, were set free, and now standing, standing before the throne. They were made righteous. We see that as well. Verse 4. Uh, verse 9 again, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands, but they're standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes. What's that all about? Well, they were made righteous before God. One pastor has said, this is the sacred calculation of God. I love that phrase. But it is not their righteousness that they are standing in. Uh, Philippians this on here. Chapter 3, verse 9 says this, Paul's saying this, and may be found in, in him, in Christ, not having, not having a righteousness uh, that is of my own, derived from the law, but the, that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. When a, when, when, when a sinner trusts Christ as Savior, God sees them in the righteousness of his son. It's placed on them. It's imputed on them. That's how God makes sinners right for heaven. And uh, none of us can stand there in our own so-called righteousness. I don't care how good you think you've done. You're not good enough. You're not perfect. We're all condemned before God because of our sin. But here they are standing, I believe, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. They have palm branches. You see, you see that in, in, in this verse as well. Palm branches were in, in their hands, verse 9, the last part of that verse. When I read about these palm branches, it takes me back, and maybe you as well, to a scene just before the cross where the crowds welcome Jesus as he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, praising him and saying with a loud voice, Hosanna in the highest. And they cast their coats and palm branches before him. Now the fact that Jesus is king, and he's about to rule as king shortly in Jerusalem, we'll get to that as we continue on through the book of Revelation. That may be the reason that they're, that they're doing this. This, that maybe it, it perhaps is that those evangelists and others have, have looked at the scriptures and they understand what the end of this looks like, and they're saying one day he's going to reign as king. He was rejected, if you remember, by his own people as king. But one day they'll embrace him, and he'll rule and reign in a righteous rule from Jerusalem. And I look forward to that thousand-year reign of Christ on this earth. It'll be done right. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And this scene reminds me of something, that those in Christ are triumphant. I'm going to come back to this again and again today, that those in Christ are triumphant. You know, there are days we don't feel like that, right? Say goodbye to a loved one, make some bad decisions, we look the world around is crumbling. Uh, we see individuals, uh, and we look to them, and, and they're doing well, and then they're not. And we're, you know, it's, it's a struggle, right? This side of heaven, it's tough. But I want to remind you of what God says, who will separate us from the love of Christ. Romans, the 8th chapter. If you're not familiar with Romans, the 8th chapter, you need to be. Will tribulation or trouble or persecution, what will separate us? Or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? 
And then we have verse 36, just as it is written, for your sake we're killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. We're in, we're in the Lord's hands. And the world looks at us differently. He has our days numbered. It's up to him. Look what, read, look what we read in verse 37 and following. But in all these things, circle that, right? If you've got a Bible, you better have this marked. You'll need it. In all these things, whatever, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, and he just runs the gamut here of possibilities, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise God. We are more than victors. So they're righteous, they're, you know, they're vast, they're worldwide, they're standing, they're righteous, they have palm branches. And lastly, we see here they worship. Look at verse 10, they cry out with a loud voice, saying, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And then it just keeps, you see this worship scene, it keeps flowing out before us. Verse 11, all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders, the four living creatures, they fall on their faces before the throne and worship God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Solid worship lyrics. You see them there. And, and their theme here is salvation, salvation to our God who sets on the throne and to the Lamb. How could they do anything else? Think about it. They are new believers. They've come to faith in Christ. They felt the sting. I believe some of these, some of these have been martyred. Some of these have, have been under the wrath of God, which has fallen on the earth. And those things have taken their life. And they realize they have something incredible there before the throne. And they worship God and the Lamb. That Jesus is fully God is an irrefutable fact that is detailed in the Scripture. He's fully God and fully man, deserving to be worshipped and praised and honored just as much as the Father. I love this worship scene. Because it says in verse 10, they cry out with what? A loud voice. I've been burdened for some time that sometimes our worship is way too quiet. Uh, there is a reverence. I understand that at times. But brother, sister, when we have opportunity corporately to sing for the glory of the Lord, sing it out. We're gaining ground. We're gaining ground. I want you to do that. Why? Because one day you're going to. We might so well get used to it now. But they cry out. They cry out. And this is a familiar uh, thought and theme through Scripture. Psalm 66, 1. Shout joyfully to God, all the earth. Shout it out. Shout joyfully to God. Psalm 100, verse 1. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth, to the glory of the Lord. And I love these worship scenes because it just seems that God's people are set free to sing, to worship, to be loud before him. And we will be set free. We're no longer, we're going to be in a perfect state with our thoughts, with our minds. Uh, we're no longer going to be battling the old sin nature. We're going to be before the throne and shout or make a joyful noise. It means to shout or sound a blast. One, turn, one pastor has talked about this worship scene as screaming at the top of their voices. In other words, they're being, they're being as loud as they can for the glory of God. They are loud, and salvation is the theme of their praise. What I notice here is it's unrestrained worship and praise to God. We're very restrained. I was reminded when I was going through this text of something that happened some years ago. Becky and I were at a Christmas program at Park River Harris Schools, and um, one of our kids, I don't know what grade or whatever, and we were, it was an elementary program, and uh, we were waiting for 
our child to step up. And while I was waiting, I was watching the parents in the crowd. And these kids would line up, uh, you know, before us. And then you see one parent, they're like, hey, Johnny, you know, and over here. And I'm thinking, come on, can we grow up or what? <laughs> and then you know what happened, right? <laughs> My child got up there. And I'm like, There'll be a day we're unrestrained because of our love for Christ. There's only one thing, one thing that matters at this point for these saints. Praising the Lord. Thanking him for their great salvation. When was the last time, brother, sister, that you thank the Lord? It's amazing to me that God would send his son for me. And that he, by his grace, would allow me to have a right relationship through faith in Christ. I can't. I've said it before. I can't believe he saved me. I can't believe he saved me. And I know some of you. And I can't believe he saved you either. Isn't that cool? Yeah. One of the most requested funeral songs we get is Amazing Grace. Why? Amazing Grace... How sweet the sound. <laughs> a saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. And this is full of thanksgiving. You see it in uh, chapter, excuse me, verse 12. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, brother, sister. Give him thanks. Well, they're joined. There's this magnificent scene around the throne, and you have, you have the angels, the elders, the four living creatures. They fall on their faces. What a scene with the saints, with those tribulation saints. There's a question asked in the verse in the end of chapter 6. The great day of the wrath of his wrath is come, and who's able to stand? We really thought that through last week. Those who have come to faith in Christ. There's an explanation. Another question is given to John, verse 14. Excuse me, verse 13. One of the elders answered, saying to me, Those who are clothed in white robes, who are they? Where have they come from? And I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. This is who they are. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. Again, what a picture here. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst anymore, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd. Be their shepherd. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. He's our shepherd forever. And will guide them to springs of water of life, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Here's the explanation to that question. The questions they asked who are they? Where have they come from? John didn't know. He didn't recognize, I think, these ones. He recognized, I think, some others from the previous uh, verse, uh, chapter 5. I think he would have recognized them again. He understood them, I believe, to be church-age saints. But the questions asked here, who are they? The answer is provided. It's there in verse, verse, uh, chapter, excuse me, verse 14. They are the ones who come out of the great tribulation period. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Well, they're, they're, the, answer, the answer is provided here. They are believers. Washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's, that's a way to express their faith in Christ and what happens because of the, of, of the cross and how that affects us. It cleanses us, see, from all sin. Ephesians 1, 7, one of my favorite verses, in him, in Christ. We have what? Redemption. We've been bought back with a price through his blood, the forgiveness of our wrongdoings according to the riches of his grace. 
They stand clothed in perfect righteousness, having been fully forgiven of all their sins. We all have this need. I trust you have placed your faith in Christ, and he has met that need. But they are believers. They are victorious. They came out of the great tribulation period. They were on earth, but now have entered into heaven via death. Almost all believers of all time, I'm speaking before the tribulation period, almost all of us will step into heaven this same way by death. But fear of death should no longer be on us. It needs not be that. Death could not hold our Lord. He left the grave that first resurrection morning powerless. He left the grave powerless, death powerless, and he left it empty, having risen from the dead. We rejoice in that fact. He's risen. And those who, those who know him can no longer be held by death's icy and dreadful grip. John eleven twenty five and 26, Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He's saying, I'm over death. It has no power over me, and it has no power over those who know me. Realize this, when these tribulation saints, listen to me closely, when they breathe their last, they open their eyes in heaven more alive than they had ever been. Can you imagine taking your last breath on earth and your next breath is expelled in praise to God as you stand among the redeemed? This is what they experienced. These who had once rejected Christ, these who were under the wrath of God, they've come to faith. They, are in, in, they were in line for his eternal wrath, but in a moment of faith set free from the wages of sin. This is true of us as well. Those, in, those who have come to faith in Christ, this is true of us. Colossians 1, 13 and 14, he rescued us from the domain of darkness and he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. And they are victorious. They are victorious. And he mentions these white robes again here uh, in verse 14. Their robes, have made, they've made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. What fellowship, what protection, what joy, what a scene. These white robes represent, again, the righteousness granted to them, to those who are, are in Christ, to those who have trusted him as Savior. Many from this period will be saved. But many will not survive the tribulation period, and they will go into Christless, into a Christless eternity where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a sobering reality. That's why the scripture says, today is the day of salvation. They serve him. There's a view out there of heaven being a place where believers sit on clouds and play a harp, float around day after day, for all eternity, that's not what the Bible says about heaven. Whatever you enjoy to the greatest degree here is incomparable to what you will enjoy in heaven. They're active, they're st serving, they stand shoulder to shoulder with the redeemed of heaven. And lastly, they enjoy his presence. In the last part of verse 15 says he spreads his tabernacle over them. Verse 16 says, these things they will, no longer, they will no longer have to battle, hunger, thirst, sun beating down on them. That's part of those, I believe, in chapter 6, as you see those, those seals opened and the wrath of God poured out. That's part of what we saw in chapter 6. I believe they experienced that. In verse 17, the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will be their shepherd. And guide them to springs of water of life, and God will wipe out. Every tear, everyone from their eyes. 
what a scene. How beautiful this is. He spreads his tabernacle over them. I love that imagery of he as shepherd, the lamb who's in the center of the throne. He will shepherd his people. You know, it's, it's, it's so beautiful. The shepherd-sheep relationship, it's an intimate relationship. And here, it's an eternal relationship. He never leaves them. Leaves them. He protects them. He seeks after them. He knows them. He hears their cries for help. He loves them to the point of death if need be. The lamb is their shepherd, and he is ours as well. Who's able to stand? Who's able to stand? Well, it's a select group. It is not those who have been made white by some work here on earth. That's not possible. It's not those who have been made white by their religion. Those things cannot make one right with God. It's not those who have been made white by way of sincerity or zeal. It's only, it's only and will only be those who have been made white by the blood of the Lamb. How does that happen? Well, it's only when, when, when those who, who understand that they have a great need for a Savior and realize that need and understand that the wages of sin is separation, it's death, and cry out to God and look to God and trust Christ as Savior, they are the ones, they are the ones who are made right with his perfect righteousness who are able to stand. Have you ever trusted Christ as your Savior? Do you know for sure if you died today that you would step into eternity in heaven? Do you know that? If not, we plead that you would trust Christ. If you still struggle to know that, I'm going to be up here. When I turn you loose in a few minutes, I'll be here. I'd love to talk to you. I'm going to loop back around here, though. These ones who have taken it on the chin on this earth, they stand triumphant in Christ. We do as well. Let's not forget this. Again, I don't want you to forget that God always causes his people to triumph. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory, Nikos, victory with room to spare, victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. I look forward to being with Jesus. I look forward to being with my Savior and those who have gone before me. I look forward to that. I hope you do as well. Not necessarily me going before you, but you know what I'm saying. And as we enter into this state, we can look forward to this. I don't think there's a funeral I've never read this at. 1 Corinthians 21, 3 through 5. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among the people. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away, what? Every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There's no funerals in heaven, friends. No longer any mourning or crying or pain. First things have passed away, and he who sits on the throne, he said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Brothers and sisters, let the proclamation of our lives be that we know and realize this, that God always causes his people to triumph. Live out that reality today. Live it out this week. Don't let the devil tell you anything other than that. Now, this may cause us to inspect our hearts, and I hope it does. I want, to ask, I want to ask the question to you who know him. Are you where you need to be in your relationship to him today? Are you there? Has the Spirit of God been speaking to you as I've been speaking, and he's saying to you, you know what, this is going on, this is not right. I'm calling you back. I'm calling you back. You need to confess that for what it is and get back with me in a right relationship. If he's doing that, run back there, friend. That's his grace. That's his love. That's his care. If you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as Savior, we would invite you to trust him now. You can cry out right where you're at in your pew from your heart something like this. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need a Savior. I'm asking in this moment that you will save me. I'm trusting in the finished work of Christ. And by his word, he says, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. You'll be forgiven, 
you'll be, you'll be saved and set loose to live a life of freedom and joy on this earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, work through this word that which you would please in us. I pray our hearts will be open, that we would be responsive and, and, and tender to the Spirit's movement in our hearts. Comfort, Father, those who grieve today. Comfort those families that grieve over loved ones who have, been, uh, have stepped into eternity. And we do grieve, Father, but not as those who have no hope. And I pray, Father, that you would, you would take each one here and allow them to realize what they have in Christ. It is amazing. And we are more than conquerors, and we need to remember that. Help us to walk, Father, counting our days and walk in humility and, and, and desiring to, to be bondservants of you who are used for your glory. And, Father, for those that are uh, online or listening, uh, listening online or perhaps in this auditorium who have yet to get it, yet to trust Christ, yet to respond to the gospel. Move them in that way, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. You're dismissed.